All right, so I talked about priority last week, and, and if you didn't hear that, I, you know, one of the things when you do a series like this is you think somebody might think, well, I'm single, I don't need a series on family, or, or uh, uh, you know, or my kids are growing up, or whatever. If you noticed last week, priority wasn't geared just toward people that are family, right? I mean, it, 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 it's about your life. What's important about family is parents, you're the number one spiritual representative to your children by the way whether they're little kids or whether they're grown I'm thankful that I started chasing after God hard when Brooke was one years old so my kids really don't know any difference in my life but but it's uh but it's very important not just the influence you have on your kids but you know Christianity is all about your influence that's what the gospel is you, you, you know you can you can tell people what the gospel says but y'all know if the person who's telling you isn't living it, you know, it's like the guy trying to sell you Pepsi, but he drinks Coke. You're going, why aren't you drinking Pepsi? You know what I'm saying? And that's what it, we have that influence on people. But today I want to talk about courage, and I, and I think courage is, is just so important. I really believe that as parents, courage is one of the things that we teach our kids. I mean, you don't sit down with them necessarily and go, hey, kid, this is courage. You live it. And one of the things that I found that's most amazing about courage is it's as inspiring and it encourages other people to be courage, courageous, that too. But we love movies like, I'll just tell you, I'll just tell you one of my favorite movies Braveheart. Braveheart's one of my favorite movies. If they could just cut all the blood and gut and gore out of it and everything. But, but the amazing thing about Braveheart is, is there's this one man who, who just decides that, that his country isn't being treated right and that things need to change, and he takes it upon himself. And, and at first, not everybody was for him and with him, and then they did amazing things. And it was all because one man got courageous, and one man went out and did some crazy courageous things and, and sacrificed his life, and, and, and everybody else jumped in and got on board. And you know what? That's what Christianity is about also. I just, I, I'll just tell you, we have a world full of pathetic, weak Christians. You know, nobody in our church is that way, but there's a lot of people out there that are just, you know, we just, we just don't live our lives out courageously as Christians because, to be honest with you, when, you, when you look at how we're to live our lives, it takes some courage because we're going against the stream. We're, we're trying to lead people somewhere that they don't want to go. We're, we're, God wants to use us to help change people's lives, and it's, it's really all about the way we go about doing it. Look at the first thing on your notes there. The first thing I put on your notes is this. Courage is not courage if there is no fear. Being fearless is not, does not mean you're courageous. You, you have to have a certain amount of fear to be cor courageous, right? To have the courage to overcome that fear, that, that, that's what you need. People that are fearless, they're nuts. They're not courageous. They're crazy. They're, there's something inside of them that either they don't respect what they're dealing with or whatever, but there are people that are do things sometimes, and you think, man, it... What a courageous guy, and, and really when you look at it, he's probably just nuts. You know what I'm saying? Courageous isn't the There are people that don't think they're courageous because of the little things they go about doing their life as they serve out their faith. But let me tell you something. It, it takes courage to overcome fear. So you don't have to be fearless to be courageous. And then the next thing on your notes there is this. Think about this. Faith, faith is not faith if you can do it without God. Faith is not faith if you can do it without God. And, and I, don't, I was taught theology bad a lot in my growing up. I, and, and I don't know what necessarily it was always from pastors, but I can't tell you I sat in little groups of Christians and, and somebody did something and, 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 and they said, uh, uh, or, and, and somebody would say to them, oh, well, that must have been of God because it was so easy for you to do. That's not faith. That's not faith. Faith, you need God. God asks us to do hard things. There are things, there are things that we get to do in our, in our life that are religious, committed to church, committed to tithing, 
uh, helping your neighbors and things like that that can just become something that we do religiously and it's pretty easy and it's just natural and you know what you don't need faith to do that if you get to the point where you're doing this religious stuff in your life and it seems pretty easy and it's just the way you've done it your whole life you need to step out of your comfort zone and go to the next level of faith that's what faith is all about so courage is not courage if there's no fear and faith is not faith is not faith if you can do it without God. Don't ever listen to somebody again that says if if it's from God it'll be easy. That's wrong. That's not in the Bible. I'm not going to tell you the whole uh David and Goliath story but it's one of my favorites because uh I think it's an example of of courage through their faith, uh, through uh, David's faith with God. The Bible says that, that David was a man after God's own heart. His, he, he lived for God, heart, soul, everything he was about was, was living for God. And uh, just quickly, the David and Goliath story, the Israelites are up on one side of the valley and, and the Philistines are over on the other side of the valley and they're just... At a stalemate, you go first. No, you go first. You go first. And there was one major problem. The Israelites were sitting up there, and they were looking at this one man who was standing down in the valley named Goliath. The Bible said he was nine feet tall. He had a couple of hundred pounds of iron on him that he wore, and he had a sword that was about as big as this room. And he was going, hey, y'all, look, let's do it this way. You send out your best guy and fight me, and that's, and that's, that's how we do it. And he says, if, if we win, then you become our slaves. And he looked back and he laughed because everybody else was about this tall and he was this tall. And he said, but if we win, you're our slaves. Well, David is off tending the sheep. Family didn't even think enough of him to take him out and fight in the battle. So his brothers are all out here. They're all waiting to fight and they're all going, you go, no, you go, you know, you go. And, and David shows up to bring some food to his brothers that his dad sent. And, and David walks up and look what it says. David's watching and he's going, what is going on? He, why, why, are y'all, why are y'all not taking the Philistines out? I don't get this. He says, you're God's people. In 1 Samuel 17, 33, Saul says, David, don't be ridiculous. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy and he's been a man of war since his youth. And David's thinking... You know, I've been living for God for a while. It doesn't matter how old I am. I got God's power in my life. He, he says, you know, I'm out taking care of the sheep. And, and he says, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. See, we, we find out in our lives a lot of times as Christians, when we try to do things in faith, whether it's start a ministry that God asks us to, wants us to start or, or even do a business that God wants us to do or, or, or forgive somebody who's been terrible to us or, or whatever, whatever we, whatever we see in God's Word or whatever we think God's wanting us to do, we tend to there be people in our lives that when we tell about it, they say, you're crazy. That's not going to work. Don't try that. And 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 I'll look. Our culture, our human nature is this: we really don't want somebody doing better than us. So we try to discourage people from being better than us, especially if they're trying to rely on God. So so you even see Christian people discourage other Christian people. But but David's going, look, I got this. I know I got this. So I just put out a formula, and I'm not a math person, but these things add up to me. Fear plus faith plus obedience equals courage. Would you agree with that? Fear plus faith plus obedience. Now, here's the deal. There's a whole lot of people who say they have the faith and they read the Bible and they go to church and all that, but they're not being obedient, so they're not getting the courage. I think you have to have all of those things to do that. And, and then the amazing thing is, is when you carry out that formula, fear plus faith plus faith plus obedience equals courage then what happens is is courage the courage that you get builds and you get plus more faith plus more obedience equals what more courage more courage <coughs> and then amazing an amazing thing happens is as this courage comes along 
it changes us and it changes the people around us. It's interesting when God tells us to be courageous. Look at Mark chapter 6, verse 50 on your notes here. Mark, this is, Jesus is coming across the water now. He's walking on the water. And, and y'all remember what happened when the, what, what happened when the disciples first saw Jesus walking across the water? Did they go, oh my goodness, look, he's the man. He is walking. A, is that what he did? What did they say? Ghost. Y'all just watch the Bible movie. You know what I'm talking about. He said, they said, ghost. And here's all these guys that have been following Jesus and watching all the miracles and everything that he does. And, and Jesus comes walking across the water and they're going, it has to be a ghost. It has to be a ghost. And then look what Jesus, look what it says. They were all terrified when they saw Jesus, but Jesus spoke to them at once. Now listen to this. Don't be what? Afraid. He said, what's next? Take courage. He says, I'm here. He says, take courage, I'm here. Now, what's interesting is I was looking at this this week, and I've never noticed this. And, and the, the Greek word translated courage is also a translation for good cheer. How weird is that? Would you think that courage would go with good cheer? And then if you had the King James Version, that's exactly what the King James Version says. The King James Version says, instead of saying, take courage, I am here, it says, be of good cheer, I am here. You wouldn't think those two things go together. So Jesus says, take courage, be of good cheer. Why? Why does he say that? What's the next thing after take courage? I am here. He's not saying take courage because you're stronger than anybody else. He's not saying take courage so you can hit somebody and you can run faster than they can. It's not, that's not the take, take courage. He's saying take courage because I'm here no matter what happens. No matter what happens, if I'm here with you, then you can take courage. You can be of good cheer no matter what's going on in your life. That's pretty powerful. That's the kind of thing that when your friends at work see happening in your life a lot of pain going on things going on yet you take good cheer that's the thing that will make your friends go you're either crazy for leaning on jesus or that's the most amazing thing i've ever seen i want what you got and that's the way it goes you might have the person that stands back and watches a little bit longer the person who's got a little bit more wisdom maybe but but most people just don't don't think that's going to happen or that's going to affect them in such a, an amazing way. I'm here, you know, I mean, fear not, fear not. You know, the angel came to Mary, the, and, and, and it, it's all about, and every time it's fear not, it's why. It's not because you're a great person. It's because I am here. God is here. Fear not is about I am here, and, and, and you should have good cheer because of that. And what comes with confidence in God and courageous faith? Next thing on your notes, joy. Joy is the product of courageous faith. Joy is the product. That's, the, that's why you can have joy in the midst of a problem in your life. That's why you can have joy when you're not healthy. That's why you can have joy when, when grandma's dying. That's why you can have joy when you've lost your job. That's why you can have joy when, when the, the bills don't match up to the money at the end of the month. That's why you can have joy when anything's going on in your life because joy's not a circumstantial thing. You know, happiness is circumstantial. Joy is something that comes from the inside. Jesus says, have good cheer, be of joy, be courageous. Why? Not because you're really anything special, but because I'm here. I'm here, and I'm going to take care of things. David says, look, at, look what he says. This is 1 Samuel 17, 47. It's 1 Samuel 17, 47. It, David said, this is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. David is yelling, David, little David. And Now, the Bible makes it very clear David is, is a kid. He's a kid. 
he's probably early teen and he's not very big he's he's a kid and and he's yelling he's the only one who's going after this giant philistine and he's saying look this is the lord's battle and you know what he's going to give you to us see one of the things that i've seen and you see here with david is when you're courageous it affects the people around you your courage encourages other people's courage your courage influences people who are not of the faith and like i said it's either gonna it's either gonna it's either gonna help change them to where they're interested in what you got or or it's gonna run them away but but it has an influence on people that are not of faith and your courage encourages other people who are of the christian faith i love what happened at the end of the story I mean, here's David, and, and he goes out, and y'all know what happened, right? Y'all saw the movie, you know? I mean, it happened, and, 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 and he kills the giant. And then look what it says, 1 Samuel 17, 51 through 52. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. So what, how did David's courage affect the Philistines? Uh-oh, you know what I'm saying? No, it's, it may be in the culture. Y'all understand better. Verse 52. Then the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines, chasing them. So how did David's courage affect the other people that were with him? It inspired them, and they got after it. And, and, and that's what I want y'all to understand. And, and, and that's, what I, that's what I want to teach with this this message on courage i want you to understand that your courage is contagious and it's a it's the biggest part i think of of what goes on with a christian in faith there were people that will look at people as they live out their life in faith and and they're going to be amazed one way or another they're going to call you a poor sucker because you're believing that or they're going to be amazed and respect you for that and it will change people's life it will change people's lives so i'm gonna i want to give you four points is it four four points on how to be a contagious christian a, a contagious how to have contagious courage the, the kind that people catch and if you're a parent i think this is a very important message y'all know that i was a counselor and i i talk to people all the time that they look back on their life and and were very affected by the relationship they had with their parents. Very affected by the relationship they had with their parents. And fathers that are in this room, you have grandfathers, the men of the kids' families. You have the greatest effect spiritually on your kids than anybody. They're watching your spiritual leadership. They're watching to see if it's real. They're watching to see if God is relevant in your life or are you just all talk. They're, they're watching to see if you act the same way at home as you act at church. They're, they're watching to see if God makes any difference in your life. So, so the first point is this. If you want to have contagious courage, the kind that inspires others and changes other people's lives, then you have to love God. Boy, doesn't it seem like that starts off every single thing that we talk about? You have to love God, you have to love your spouse, love your kids, and love others. And it takes courage to do real love. It takes real courage to do real love. Parents, how do your kids know that you love God? Just think about it for a second. Do they know because you tell them you love God? Do they know because you go to church? Do they know because you read your Bible? Do they know because they see you praying before your meals? How do your kids know? Those are all important things, right? But if those things don't match up with your behavior? Our church is full of people that about the time they got old enough to make their own decision about God, they left church and came back to God years later. And some of you know people that left God when they become young adults and have never been back to God. Ever been back to God. A big reason for that is, is the influence that their parents have on them. And, I, and I'm not just talking about it. You look, I, I, 
I've known people that go to church every single time the doors are open, but when you see them dealing with real life and you see them dealing with anger and you see them dealing with anxiety and you, you see them acting like jerks out there in the world and you see them not acting like who they say they act like at church, that has a very negative effect on their kids more than anybody else. Husbands, how does your wife know that you love God? Employee, how does your employer know that you love God? I've told you all about the guy we had in my office for years before I became a, 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 a strong Christian who just, I just kept thinking if that guy's our representative, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Here's how. 1 Corinthians 13. It's interesting. I've put 4 through 7, but I want to tell you what, one through four says y'all we i use first corinthians 13 four through seven a lot because i've watched it change lives i was talking to a guy on the phone the other day that was having trouble with a relationship and i said look why don't you do this why don't you get out a, a three by five cards and you write down what thir- first corinthians 13 four through seven and you live that you pray that and i promise you it's going to make some kind of positive change on your relationship but, but 1 Corinthians 13, the end of 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul is talking about faith and how to live out your life. And he says, but look, there's a better way, the best way to go about doing this. Matter of fact, you can tell by what he says in verses 1 through 3, this is the only way to go about it. He, says, he said, look, I can speak all languages of the earth and the angels, but if I don't love others, I would only be a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Y'all have known some people like that. If I've had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, then I would be nothing. And if I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. I would say verse 3 probably rings more true to most Christians who have grown up in Christian homes supposedly with parents that didn't act like Christ more than anything. You know, they're, they're giving, they're going to their church, they're serving, they're in Bible study, they're in all these other kind of things, but they don't have love. So what ends up happening is, is they're irrelevant and, and they're nothing except for a bad spiritual influence. So the key to effective, courageous, contagious faith is what's in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Look at this. And most of you are familiar if you've been here very long. I call this the love list. By the way, just a little trick of the trade. If, if you want to, to be better in any relationship, I promise you, you get out a card, you get out something, write it on your little note thing on your iPhone, and, and you write down love is patient, love is kind, love's not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Verse 7, say this with me. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Is that easy or hard? Doesn't that take courage? I mean, just think about it. Just think about the courage that it takes to overcome your own selfish anger when you're dealing with a child who's getting on your nerves terribly at this moment and my kids never got on my nerves, but I know y'all's kids because they're not as good as mine. But, you, but doesn't that happen? How hard is it to be patient? I think it's interesting. I think that patient is, there's a reason patience number one on this list. Would you agree you, you can't do any of the other ones without it? You know, love is patient and kind. It's, it's, If you can pray through this on a regular basis, look, if you've got a child right now that you're really struggling with and you're just having trouble being patient with them, and you're, and, and, you know, one of the things that makes it to where we struggle when we deal with other people is we, they've got this history with us. So the first thing we think is, you know, there's people that walk into the room, and, and there's people you know that when they walk into the room, your first thought is, is they're going to be negative or they're going to be positive. 
or they're going to be we've got to, and you know why we do that because we have a history well some of us our kids start going through a certain stage in life where they're they're just be quite honest with you they're a pain in the rear and the person they need to be the most patient with them and loving and 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 not holding a grudge not not holding uh, over them the things that they've done in the past is is their parent don't you think it takes courage to do that see i think moms i think i think the courage that a mom has is is a Look, I think any, any one of us in this room, we were driving down the street today and we saw a house on fire, just adrenaline and everything. We would jump out of our car and we would run in there and we would do what we could to try to pull somebody out of a house. I just don't think there's very many people that wouldn't do that. And you know what would happen? They would be written up in the paper as being a great hero and all that. And, and I think when they interview people, and some people are honest, some people just go, well, I didn't even think about it. I just it was just the thing that I was supposed to do the, the house was burning the person was dying I heard the kid in there screaming and I I just took off and ran and 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 that's more adrenaline than courage now the firemen who do that for a living and they're either crazy or courageous right because that's a that's a thing they have to think through every single day moms dads that are dealing with your little kids it takes courage to be a good parent. It takes courage to give in when they don't to, to not give in when they don't want to poop on the pot. You know, it takes courage to 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 think that they're screaming like you're hurting them, but you're you know that you're really helping them. It takes courage to do that on a regular basis. Moms, dads, that's huge. That's huge. It, it takes courage. It takes courage to be nice to the guy that's sitting beside you and, and, and have patience at work and, and not be boastful or proud when you're doing a good job and he's doing a sorry job. It, it takes courage to be able to do that. It takes courage to be the kind of boss that you're supposed to be when you've got people that are working for you and you're supposed to be there representing Christ. It takes courage to, to throw out your own feelings and, and, and selfish feelings that come to you naturally and be nice to the store clerk that's treating you rude or, or the waiter that you've just decided that, well, if I was in my natural mind, I would not give them a tip, but I'm going to double it just to try to make their day better. It takes courage to do all that kind of stuff. And those are things that you think through on, on a regular basis. This is, this is contagious courage. This is the kind of things that has the most positive influence on the people that are around you. You've got to ask yourself, do you love God? And if you say yes, then you've got to say, does it show? Am I always striving to honor God and to, to seek His will? Do, do I love my spouse? Do my kids, do my kids know from my actions that I love my spouse? Do my kids know? I want to tell you something. Do you respect your spouse? You know one of the commercials that I hate? It's a Toyota or something commercial. And the dad's out with the kids, and something happens, and he says what? Don't tell your mom. And you think, oh, yeah. They go do something else. He goes, don't tell your mom. And I'm thinking, if I do a few of those, I'm dead as soon as Lisa finds out I'm, I'm dead. That's, so I have two motives for that. But, but let me tell you something. We, as, as parents, the, the, greatest, the greatest thing we can do, the, the next, here's the next thing I put on your notes. Kids will feel the most confident when their parents love each other. You want a confident, courageous kid? The best way to do that is to love each other. Look, if you're divorced and you're not, you're, you're, and you're duking it out with your ex, and and you can't ever agree on this, and you're fighting and you're manipulating the kids back and forth, and you know who you're hurting? Your kids desperately, because kids even want their divorced parents to love each other, even if there's never a chance that they'll ever get back together again. The kids want to know that mom loves dad and that dad loves mom, and that's the thing that's going to give your kids a great greatest confidence and the greatest courage it's important and for those of you that are married and you've got your kids you know Lisa and I we, we tried to have a policy we didn't argue in front of the kids we argue in front of them all the time now but but when our kids were little and impressed easily impressed we uh 
we, we kind of had a rule. If, if one of us started to raise our voice, the other one was supposed to go, shh, let's go wait till the kids go to bed or let's go in the other room or, or let, you know what I'm saying? Because we, we wanted to see our kids see us loving each other and, and they're not in an age where they can understand that a whole lot. The other thing is, is when you do fight, your kids need to see you make up. Your kids need to see you love each other. Your kids need to see you not holding a grudge against your wife because she's done this all these years. Your kids don't need to see you making fun of her at the dinner table. It's awful. I just when I be when I'm in situations like that and I and I see a man making fun of his wife or a woman, I just want to slap somebody in a holy way. I'm just telling you, and especially with your kids. You know, we know how much it tears up a marriage. But respect is one of the greatest things you can do for each other, and it's one of the greatest things that you can do for your kids. And, and then your kids need to see you loving other people, and, and they need to see how you, do you speak to others as a Christian would speak to people. Do you, do you see the best in people instead of always looking for the worst? Do, do you respect your boss? Do you respect your neighbors? Do you respect the clerk down at the store? How about politicians? What do you think it does to your kids to sit, hear you bad-mouthing the president of the country that they live in every single time you open your mouth? I mean, just think about it. Yeah, I mean, we can have those conversations with each other and stuff, but, but look, people are so darn disrespectful and nasty and ugly and pass on any law, any lie that comes along, whether they, you know what I'm saying? It's terrible. How about police officers? How about the neighbor whose dog barks all the time? How does your kid handle, see you handle the, the neighbor whose dog barks all the time? Just those are things to think about. We all like to stay in our comfort zone, what, whatever it may be. And, and I want to tell you something. Real love, courageous, contagious, faith love cannot be found in your comfort zone. So we've got to love God, our spouse, our kids, and others. Number two, be authentic and consistent. Be authentic and consistent. That's, that's so important. Y'all hear me talk about this all the time. We, the trouble most Christians have with their faith is they make it an emotional thing. If I feel emotional, then I'm going to be cool with my faith. If I don't feel, I can't tell you how many people come up to me and, and are just, they, they've been extremely moved by the worship. They've been moved by God today. They're excited about what God's doing in life. They want to make a, good, a, new, a new commitment to life. And, but it doesn't change their life at all. Because what happens, that's why we, at the end of the service we have our time with God here. Because I know there's a really good chance that if you don't pray about what you've been convicted about here before you leave, then you're going to get out there and get involved in the world and forget about what God convicted you of. Be authentic. Be consistent. Your kids need to see that everything you're about is about chasing God. Jesus jumped all over the Pharisees because they tried real hard to look good on the outside, but they were dying on the inside. Look at uh, Luke eleven thirty eight through 41. Jesus' host was amazed to see that he sat down and he ate without first performing the hand-washing ceremony required by the Jewish custom, the religion. Then the Lord said to them, You Pharisees are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but you are filthy. You're full of greed and you're full of wickedness. He says, Fools. Uh-oh, when Jesus calls you fool. Fools. Didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? He says, so clean the inside by giving gifts to the poor, and you will be clean all over. In other words, he's saying, look, if you want to clean the inside, then you need to make other people more important than you are to yourself. You need to care about other people more than you care about yourself. It, being authentic and consistent is about, about who you love and, and how you go about doing your life. Clean the inside now. You know, even when we, you know, you may, you may learn to change a behavior, but if you don't change what's going on inside, it's not going to change who you are. Be consistent. How consistent are you in your faith? How consistent are you in your worship, your Bible study, your prayer? That's, 
that's the religious stuff. That's the, the discipline stuff. That's the stuff that helps if you're being obedient on top of that. Well, how consistent are you as a parent? How consistent are you as a spouse, as a neighbor, as an employer? How consistent are you in your faith when you're doing business? What about when life is going good? How consistent are you? What about when life is going bad? What do your kids know about you when life is going bad and you're dealing with your relationship with God? When prayer isn't being answered the way you want, how consistent are you in your faith? What about when you're in great emotional pain? Do your kids still see that you have this great, courageous relationship with God? What about when someone you love is having a bad day? What about when their bad day turns into a bad month? What about when their bad month turns into a bad year? What about they're not meeting your needs anymore? Then how do your kids see you dealing with your faith with those people? Galatians 6, 9. Let's not get tired of doing what's good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Number three, model dealing with pain and faith. Model dealing with pain and faith. You know, I, I'm just going gonna, gonna to throw something out there. Um... If you're struggling with your faith, in, your faith and in pain, call me. Call me. If it gets overwhelming, I'll tell you to quit calling me, but I don't think it'll happen. Y'all have the permission. You know, you know, I've had people mad at me in the past because I didn't help them deal with a problem in their life, and they never even told me they had a problem. It happens all the time as a pastor. I don't, I don't know. People just think you can read their minds or... Or whatever, or maybe you say something to me in passing on Sunday and I was supposed to pick that up. I'll just tell you something. My brain usually isn't in the conversations real well on Sunday morning. But I told somebody this morning, you're having a hard week, call me. You know, if you can do it not at 2 o'clock in the morning, that's better. But if you've got to call me at 2 o'clock in the morning, call me. I'll wake Lisa up and she can talk to you. Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble comes your way, consider an opportunity for great joy, for you know that your faith is tested. Your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So pain is the thing that actually helps us grow. Number four, teach an attitude of gratitude. And the best verse for that is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17, I think. It says, always be joyful. Stay connected to God always in prayer. Be thankful in all circumstances. And you know what? You can teach that to your kids so easily by just living out things in front of your kids. 